Kat Solver with the Dr. Ways in, and we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. I have with me today Kevin Lyman, who is the COO and a scientist, and he'll tell us what that's all about at a very interesting company called Enlytic, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area in my in my neighborhood. And I've had a chance to visit the headquarters and get to know Kevin and some of the things that they're doing. And that's what we want to share today. So Kevin, I thought we'd start out by having you tell us what is Enlytic up to? What is why were you founded? What is your what is your mission? What do you hope to accomplish with the company? Well, we develop clinical applications of artificial intelligence, primarily aimed at helping doctors to make faster, earlier, and more accurate diagnostics. And mainly today in the radiology space, uh, though we're also getting quite active outside of that as well. And really, we're driven uh, with the mission of improving patient outcomes around the world. Uh, roughly one in four patients today are misdiagnosed. Uh, meaning they might receive treatment they don't even need. Uh, and another one in four... Or they might not get treatment that they did need. Exactly. And that's another one in five who have their diagnosis missed altogether and are likely missing out on treatment they may desperately need. And even worse than that, almost 70% of the world lacks access to high-quality radiologists altogether. And with uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence, we have the ability to learn from the knowledge of these doctors around the world in order to develop tools that can help them on the fly in interpreting these studies. So there's a lot of um, misconception about exactly what artificial intelligence is. And I thought that perhaps using the um, what, one of the diagnostics that you guys have been working on, which is lung cancer CT screening, uh, that you could help us to understand not just the power of your tool, but kind of lift up the veil a little bit and tell us how the tool actually gets developed, and even more important is how it continues to learn and get better and better. Absolutely. And that's a topic we really love to talk about at Enlytic because in healthcare, transparency is key. And a lot of people are turned off by deep learning and artificial intelligence because of the view that it's a black box. Uh, and in many cases, it is. The underlying math that's performed uh, isn't necessarily as important as the end goal that you're trying to train the model to do. Uh, in looking at it as a black box, you can think on one side goes an input, on the other side goes a target output. What would you like that black box to figure out how to pull out of that unsorted input? And if you have enough examples of that, the model can eventually learn how to get it right most of the time, ideally all of the time. Uh, in our case, that's where we really focus most of our attention, is making sure that we're asking the right question about the type of data that we're looking at, and that we're standardizing the creation of enough data of that type to train a sophisticated model to do that interpretation. Uh, in the case of uh, lung cancer screening, we're developing models to help doctors to detect and diagnose lung nodules in chest CT scans. Uh, by one, helping them identify every nodule, but two, understand which ones need follow-up, which ones don't, and why. Uh, and in training a model to do this, we realize that it largely comes down to a people problem. The model needs something to learn from. Uh, and so we start every one of these problems by developing annotation guidelines, uh, typically around 100 pages of them for every problem that we work on. And we gather some of the world's best experts to form those insights. But really what they detail are the difference between clinically reading a scan and reading it for the sake of training a machine learning model. In the case of training a lung cancer model, we essentially uh, show our radiologists several years of scans from a single patient along with a known biopsy outcome. So we know that three years from now, that patient ultimately wound up having a proven malignancy. So I see the little ditzel, I follow it over time, and at the end of the day, all through that process, I know that it's going to end up being lung cancer. Exactly. So in this case, you're reading a case with a lot more clinical context than you would in a real clinical setting, because you know the patient has a malignancy, and you're able to trace that back in time. This enables us to give the model a good idea of not only what does malignancy look like, but what did malignancy look like two years before we realized it was malignancy? Uh, and we've built out a, a wealth of tools to enable radiologists to look at our historic scans to label them in this way. Uh, today we have about 65 radiologists that use this platform, and we do a great deal of work to qualify them to ensure that they're up to the task of doing this interpretation. Because if you put garbage into your system, you're going to get garbage out. And it's critical that we continually monitor for that. And so we have every radiologist that works with us take uh, multiple rounds of tests of that type, where essentially we give them the guidelines, we give them YouTube tutorial videos, we even give them live examples, and we ask them to do a test and then get on a call with a specialist, somebody who spends all day looking at chest nod uh, lung nodules. 
And they walk them through answer by answer in the test set. What did you get right? What did you get wrong? And if you did get it wrong, why? Was it a perceptive error? Was it a cognitive error? Uh, was it an issue with the tool itself? And we try to train you to do that task better and give you another test. And if we see you improved, then we put you on what we call a buffet of tasks, where essentially you can continue to label them anytime you have spare time. You could just log in with Google Chrome and start to chip away cases to continually train our models. Um, and so, so first you trained the trainer, right? First you trained the doctors how, how to be able to do it, and then and then those doctors are able to train the models. Uh, it, it, to, and I assume that you keep doing that over and over again. Exactly, and that's why we say that artificial intelligence development is really more of a people problem, because. Uh, in artificial intelligence, you're not synthesizing that artificial uh, knowledge out of nowhere. You're collecting a lot of human knowledge based on what we know people have figured out how to do quite well. And then we're training a model to learn that same thing based on those examples. And so ultimately, there's nothing to learn if there's no examples. Uh, and to get the standardized examples in the way that we need them, that involves a lot of training people. And so we, of our 65 radiologists, many of them are advisors that their job used to be to train the model. Now it's to train the people that train the model. Uh, and we found that to be a, a very interesting iterative process to see who's developing faster. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say as somebody who's sort of on the periphery, I talk to a lot of people about AI, but I, I'm, I'm not an AI scientist or, you know, coder or whatever, Not certainly not an expert somehow it was just mystical to me. It was that black box. But when you translate it into this is people, this is taking, this is using humans and taking human knowledge to train machines to do what they did, only they're able to do it better because they don't have uh, some of the perceptual or cognitive challenges that human beings have. Um, that, that really grounds it for me. And I think the other thing is, this is all about trust, right? This is all about trust. If you train your models incorrectly and they and you don't get many chances at, at, at that you train them incorrectly and you get the wrong answer you'll lose customers and you'll lose traction and then you won't have money to pay 65 radiologists more importantly patient lives are at risk and more importantly patient lives are at risk absolutely uh, and so we put a great deal of effort into making sure that that process is well formulated throughout and in fact we find the most interesting cases to look at are the ones where we got it wrong and then we sit with specialists to try to trace that bias back. Uh, so why did the model make this prediction when it shouldn't have? And I would say nine times out of ten, we can trace that back to the training data. We can see that this was something that somebody had not followed the rules appropriately when annotating examples. Uh, and we can then go back and fix that issue and then see that systematic bias removed as we retrain the system. And so that leads to a very effective uh, iterative process of model improvement. And uh, as I'd mentioned, when patient lives are on the line, every little bit of accuracy counts. Uh, and so that's why uh, we find that this is such a critical uh, process. Uh, but we like to be the voice of demystifying how AI works because there's a lot of misconception. There's a lot of natural fear. And I think we can understand that uh, because it's hard to deal with a black box. But uh, I saw somebody actually just tweet this a couple days ago, a, a very convenient example of this. If I were to show you a house and ask you, is this a house, yes or no, if you told me yes, I wouldn't ask you to explain why you think that's a house. Exactly. Yeah. And in radiology, there are many rules that we know are definitively the case for diagnosing things. There are many cases where we don't. In a lot of cases, it does come down to a human has built up this perception from seeing a lot of examples, and they can't articulate in rules exactly how they did that. And so it becomes critical to learn from these examples. Uh, but because that's the case, you shouldn't be asking what neurons fired in this black box because you don't ask what neurons fired in a person's brain. You should be asking what led to this conclusion. How are you trained to form this insight in the first place? And that's why we like to show these training processes end to end. And then you, you also are interested in how, how accurate it is. I followed the process and I got the answer right how many times. So can you tell us, let's use the lung CT scanning. How... How accurate, accurate are you compared to what, let's say, the average or, or the average of the best radiologists are? Well, accuracy is a very, uh, a very nuanced topic uh, because even the task of detection versus diagnosis can be uh, quite different in how it's set up. Uh, but in our latest internal test, we took a 1,000 patients worth of CT scans, all of whom we knew the biopsy results for, uh, but blinded our radiologists to that and had a panel of four radiologists try to spot all the malignancies in those cases. 
And we found that the panel of four caught 93% of the malignancies, but with a false positive rate of about two thirds, uh, which actually is about average for clinical incidence. Uh, but our models, on the other hand, caught 100% of the malignancies and with about half the false positive rate. Uh, but the much more interesting insight from that study was the realization that we're often picking up these malignancies up to two years earlier than human radiologists are. Uh, because our models have emerged new insights of their own by nature of having been trained on future ground truth uh, by our expert radiologists in this labeling process. And that's so critical because, well, first of all, let's talk about the false, um, the false negatives. Those aren't just, oh, I, I got it wrong. It's it, it, somebody got a biopsy, right? So you had a procedure as a result of, um, I'm sorry, false positive. So you had a, a procedure as a result of that. Um, so all of these things have consequences. Um, and and what you're describing is, is really a significant increase in the accuracy compared to the human radiologist who's not out of the picture. The human radiologist is helping to train the machine. So uh, I find that whole thing very, um, very fascinating how the, all the pieces fit together. I want to ask you something else. You talked about how you have to train the machine to really answer the right question. And I, I recall that you and I talked about this before, that a lot of people who are doing AI in radiology are, are asking the question, is this lung cancer or is this not? And you told me that you guys have a different approach. Can you explain to me what that is? We do. And uh, just uh, prior to that, uh, another note about the comment you'd made just before that. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that when deploying these models, uh, the intent is never to have the model replace the radiologist altogether and automate the whole process. Uh, I think when, if people were to think about it end to end, they would realize they don't want a fully automated lung cancer screening. They don't want a world where they go into a CT machine AI determines they have a malignancy, and then a robotic arm automatically with no human in, uh, intervention sticks a needle in to biopsy the result. Yeah, that's a scary thought. It is. And uh, that's why it's critical to keep in mind that in that test I described, that was model versus uh, human performance. But in reality, it'll always be model plus human performance. The patient should be getting the best of both worlds. Uh, and the radiologist should be getting an accuracy and efficiency increase from that process. Really, you should have two co-pilots driving this as opposed to just one in a vacuum. Uh, but to uh, touch on the, the uh, topic that you had just brought up, we find that asking the right question is utterly critical. And I think that uh, what we're doing in chest x-rays is a very convenient example of that. Because in chest x-rays, our goal is not just to find lung cancer. It's to find every visual pattern that is indicative of a need for follow-up. And that's because in a real clinical environment, no radiologist looks for just one thing. They look for everything. They have to. And so AI should be held to the same standard, uh, especially because it can catch a lot of subtle things that the radiologist otherwise may have missed or not even have been looking for. Uh, but in a chest x-ray, it's a convenient example because they're notoriously nonspecific. Uh, they're very sensitive, and that's why they're ubiquitous, because they're cheap and they can give signs to a lot of abnormality. But they're never really capable of diagnosing the patient fully in a vacuum. And we find that that's a pretty critical realization when you're training a model. Because if that labeling process involves showing an x-ray and nothing else to a radiologist and saying, does this patient have tuberculosis, yes or no, it's not really a fair question. Diagnosing tuberculosis requires a lot more information than just a chest x-ray. Right. And that's why, as, as a former internist and emergency physician, when the radiologist would get so mad at us because we didn't bother to fill out any clinical history, we would just send the x-ray over and, and expect them to be able to get to the diagnosis that we want. And what you're saying, if I can translate it and tell me if I got it right, is that you're not trying to say it is TB or it is lung cancer. What you're trying to say is there is a mass and there is a differential diagnosis to that mass. And now you've got to do you know, some other test to get to the definitive diagnosis. Exactly. It's important to keep in mind what step of the process we're actually trying to augment with AI. And too quickly, people like to jump to the whole end-to-end -end process. In reality, we're handling a piece of it. We're handling the piece where you interpret the chest x-ray. What we should be saying from a chest x-ray is this patient has a calcified lung nodule, uh, maybe uh, an edema, pleural effusion, and cavitation or consolidation. Those are signs that are indicative of tuberculosis. You sounded like a radiologist. <laughs> when you spend all day training models to learn radiology, you learn a lot of it yourself. Uh, but in that case, the model can confidently output that all of these visual findings and visual patterns are within the image. 
but it can't accurately make the jump that it must be TB unless we use other models to read other clinical evidence to support that. So in this context, we could have an imaging model read the chest x-ray, and we could have an NLP model read their clinical history, and if those things match up, then we can say a differential diagnosis more accurately of TB. So Kevin, um, we've talked about the CT scan uh, screening for lung cancer, but how many models have you actually built now, and how much of this is deployed in a way that's actually touching patients at the current time? So uh, up to this point, we've primarily focused our development in about five or so different areas, uh, doing chest x-ray, head CT, chest CT, prostate MRI, and mammography interpretation. And throughout the course of this year, we have about eight different clinical studies organized with partners around the world, uh, testing different deployment types of those models. But really, we've built those out with the intent of showing that this works across all modalities and body regions. Because now our intent is to scale that for full body coverage of x-ray, CT, ultrasound, and MR. Uh, and so that's what we're building out over the course of the next three or so years, uh, trying to cover about 45 study types and about 95% of diagnostic radiology uh, for global abnormality detection. And is, any of, is this all really still in the pilot study phase, or, or do you have customers who are actually just using it to take care of patients? Well... Because accuracy is so key in this uh, and validation is such a critical step, we like to be ultra conservative about letting people truly clinically deploy models. And so right now, uh, everything that we're doing is under the context of a clinical study. Uh, and we anticipate that we'll maintain that uh, level of deployment for the next couple of years uh, while we build out a massive amount of coverage before pursuing uh, a wider commercialization. And largely, that's being driven by the, the need to be very careful in the development of these systems and to ensure that we're truly improving patient outcomes, but also improving workflow for doctors and covering a significant amount uh, of their workflow to justify uh, the deployment or integration of new AI systems. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And what about FDA approval or approvals of equivalent uh, organizations in other countries? So we have a very interesting uh, uh, clinical uh, regulatory strategy in that the, what, what does not get approval is a technology. What does get approval is a very specific application or a claim of a technology. And so really it depends on how you use our models, uh, whether or not that's something that's accepted in a various regulatory jurisdictions. Uh, for example, we primarily note that there's three ways that radiologists really use our models. And that comes down to, did the model read it before the radiologist, alongside the radiologist, or after the radiologist? Um, if it's reading it before them, then it's prioritizing scans. It's triaging them as they're interpreted, and it's telling you what you should look at or what you should look at quicker or place more attention on. And we're actually doing a clinical study around that with a major hospital network in Canada uh, with support from the Canadian government uh, to uh, triage head CTs as they're captured by the modality machine in order to indicate patients with time-sensitive findings to ensure that they're given treatment quicker than others. Uh, now, if we had read the scan after the fact, so after the radiologist already generated a report, then we're talking about more of a quality assessment or second read deployment. And we're currently doing that with our partner Capital Health in Australia, uh, where we can use our models at the end of every week to reread their chest X-ray images, as well as the reports their radiologists wrote about it, and point out any discrepancies. Uh, so, and then try and figure out who was right and who was wrong. Right. And so we flag those cases for review for either their QA lead or a chief radiologist to look at that to resolve those discrepancies. And so it's almost like having another full-time radiologist to do a second read on every one of your studies to offer the insurance that you're not over or under calling findings. Um, and finally, if the model reads it alongside the radiologist as opposed to before or after, then that's real-time diagnostic support. Uh, so that would be like circling nodules and giving them characteristic information about that. Uh, and that's probably, from a regulatory standpoint, the uh, most difficult type of uh, approval to attain. Uh, and some of those other deployment types, though, triage and quality assessment, in many parts of the world don't require regulatory improvement uh, because they're being used as a uh, workflow efficiency tool as opposed to as a diagnostic aid. So... This sounds very labor intense, even though the machine is, is going to ultimately do the work. It's really labor intense to get there. You must have 
a cast of thousands. How many people are actually working for the company? Uh, we have about 20 full-time people, uh, most of which I'd say are radiologists or data scientists or engineers. And you're working day and night? <sighs> day and night. Uh, I'm usually up at 3 a.m. talking to uh, radiologists somewhere in the world studying their workflow. Uh, but we also have about 70 part-time, uh, almost all of which are radiologists that uh, work in their spare time to actually train our system and annotate cases. Uh, and that's a part of the team that will be uh, very aggressively scaling over the course of the next uh, year or so. So I have... Uh uh, two questions. Um, one is, what other diagnostics are you currently working on outside of radiology? And then uh, the last one is, where do you think you're going to be in five years? Well, uh, I think one of the things that's really interesting about deep learning as an approach is that the exact same approach we've described for radiology works quite well in most other digital diagnostic areas. Uh, you could imagine that if the goal was to find a genetic defect given a genetic sequence, it's still the exact same process. We would take unlabeled genetic sequences and we would have geneticists label them for the defects that are present and train a deep learning model to do that. Um, and in fact, we've uh, done publications in the past showing how our natural language models can be used for that type of interpretation. Uh, but uh, outside of that, we're also exploring use cases in pathology, uh, looking at automatic interpretation of slides, uh, as well as in cardiology, looking at types of studies like ECGs or EKGs, uh, trying to do automatic interpretation there. But we do a lot of analysis of medical text, uh, primarily for the sake of uh, automatically labeling historic data, but also for bringing major efficiency improvements in the medical billing and coding industry. Uh, but we certainly see that the exact same technology has major implications in ophthalmology, dermatology, uh, and many other ologies. So when I ask you where you think you'll be in five years, is this analytic dominates healthcare? <laughs> uh, really, our goal is to build the world's highest quality corpus of medical knowledge as it pertains to training a machine learning system. The hard part is collecting the data. The hard part is collecting it the right way. Uh, and ensuring that it's actually a, a true representation of ground truth, but also that it's holistic. If I don't label for findings X, Y, and Z now, then two years from now, when I realize that I actually want to build a model to find X, Y, and Z, I'm going to kick myself for not asking people to label X, Y, and Z two years ago. Uh, and so that's another part of it. Right now, when we label, we're labeling for everything, uh, trying to build up really what our chief medical officer calls the Oxford English Dictionary uh, of that machine translation. And, and really, I'd say that's uh, where I see ourselves in five years is having a, a corpus of medical knowledge so great that we could build models that expressively even cross those ologies. Uh, combining radiology with pathology and cardiology and ophthalmology uh, to get more holistic diagnostic understanding uh, of the entire human body. Um, and I think that that's going to lead to some pretty amazing patient outcomes. Yeah, I was going to say, this is, this is really exciting stuff, and it's going to be good for doctors, good for the healthcare system, but most of all, it's going to be good for patients. So I want to thank you, Kevin, very much for sharing with us all the things that Analytic is doing and what we can look forward to in the next five years and hopefully for a long time after that. So thank you very much. Thank you as well.